Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hey everyone, we're back with a women who lead show and we had to do this thing where we start chatting and then I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, we have to record this. This is funny. So Catherine, (laughs) Lippo. Uh, you know, what, why do I do that every time? Why do I always well, you say Catherine no, you, Greer Limpo? Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> I was going to say Catherine Limpo is fine too, but yes, <laughs> Catherine Greer Limpo. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, see, now I get it wrong too. No, maybe we should start again. <laughs> no, this is perfect. <laughs> Women who <Okay>. lead. <laughs> Women who lead. Okay, so I had just written a letter to a friend named Kirsten yesterday, and I get names terribly wrong. So, I Kirsten, it's so good to to be here with you again this morning. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a while, and um, lots to lots to talk about. I've had some incredible epiphanies, but I, you and I both were like, "Excuse me, what baking soda? What uh, over the whole yeah. <laughs> Huffington Post article that came out?" Um, when the heck did that came out? It came out, I'm looking at it right now. So this was 10, 21, 2019 women at Ernst and young instructed on how to dress, act nicely around men. Now you just said something hilarious about what you thought the article was. So please share with the listeners. Yeah. So, um, I was sharing that when I first saw the headline and read the first couple of paragraphs. I really thought it was an onion article. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 saw, I don't know. I think it was actually, we were talking about her too, Shahida Arabi who posted it on Twitter and that's how I saw it and went, what? <laughs> like I had to do a double take about women should look healthy and fit with a good haircut and manicured nails. Now, there isn't anything like this for the male executives. And that's just, that's like the easy, easy to swallow piece of it. It goes into all kinds of just mm-hmm. on women's brains, absorb information like pancakes, soak up syrup. Yeah. So it's hard for them to focus. Men's brains yeah. are more like waffles. They're better able to focus because the information collects in each little waffle square. <sighs> Wonderful. <laughs> no, I'm like, I don't want a waffle or a pancake after the reading of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So at first glance, humorous, because I thought, oh, that's so ridiculous. That can't possibly be real. But then in digging to the article more, you know, this was um, a leadership program that they ended in 2018, thankfully, you know, a few lawsuits ensued. I won't go into a lot of that detail, but the program itself was entitled Power, Presence, and Purpose. And if we just look through and, um, you know, see some of the messages that are embedded in here. So, you know, the way, the difference uh, in the way men and women think, like you were just mentioning, right? (laughs) These ridiculous illustrations of um, you know, how distracted men can get by women's skin and, you know, any sort of external sexiness. So none of that is allowed in order to have the entire workforce be 
uh, completely effective. And then there's also a table in the article that contrasts uh, masculine and feminine attributes. And apparently one of the goals was to score these attributes both at work and not at work, like you um, are a different person when you're not at work. Um, but just the fact that these um, qualities have been um, div <laughs> divided into masculine and feminine, I'm just going to read a couple, a yes. couple out here. So for feminine, uh, it's affectionate. Uh, apparently, the is it a parallel that's on the same line, or is it just a masculine attribute? So feminine attributes are affectionate, cheerful, childlike, compassion, does not use harsh, lang harsh language, eager really? to soothe hurt feelings, and femininity. Now, these are just the first couple, right? And then masculine attributes, apparently, are acts like a leader aggressive, ambitious, analytical, assertive, athletic, and competitive. Oh, and yes. I love this one. Fl women under the feminine side is flatterable and on the men's yes. side it's defends one's beliefs. Yep. Yep. And I like loyal versus independent too. So women, <laughs> women are women like a golden are retriever. And right. men are the lion of the king of the jungle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. So I, I guess now that I, I look at this, I, this inherently sort of offends me <laughs> on many <laughs> levels. But okay, so not, not to take this too personally. Um, I, you know, I'm just thinking of other conversations that we've had recently. So if you think of, um, you know, Brene Brown and authentic leadership or even Abby Wambach and, and the Wolf Pack and the notion of using all of your strengths and skills in leadership or, you know, what, and we've talked about leadership in every aspect of life. It's not just, you know, being the leader of a company. It's, you know, being leader for PTA or being the, right. you know, the head of your household or the, you know, the leader as a mom or, or just a um, leader you know, in your own life. life. Exactly, leader of your own life. How can you possibly show up to work knowing that the expectation of you is to suppress the best parts of you? <laughs> oh, I know, and Ernst, I mean, the, uh, not only is this right, you know, after me too, but uh, like this is like something that you would see. I, I thought this was some sort of joke, also, as an episode. Um, Write up that was going to be done on the next, you know, reboot of Mad Men. I, I, I could not even fathom that this was actually <laughs> for real. And then they have gone out afterwards and had women doing videos saying, I love these and I loved those courses, Ernst and Young, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, you know, has that not been done forever? Tout out the women who will stand there and say, and I'm not putting those women down at all, at all, because what are they supposed to do? We know what it's like mm -hmm. in those environments. Of course you have to say that you believe in it. Hello, mm -hmm. it's your job, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's such a, it's just oh, unbelievable. Sorry. Is that a dog? It's my dog. <laughs> That's okay, because mine are running around on the floor beneath us. And so if you hear... It's not me looking <laughs> at Catherine on the thing if my dog's drinking water out of a dog bowl. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Mine's just my dog barking in the background. I don't know what he's barking about. But anyway, I yes. just, yeah, I, 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 I this, I'd say this is laughable and to write it off, but the reality is it's, it's horrific. <laughs> it's real. This is happening today. At Ernst mm -hmm. and Young, this is going on right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know, um, we've had many conversations about showing up as yourself and using your strengths of your history and your past, regardless of what that is. You know, so many of us have overcome so much, and to show up with the lessons of our past and how we've overcome um, is authenticity. You know, that's how we lead as authentic leaders. And that's how we share our life lessons, 
you know, with, with the folks in our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another section here that really flies in the face of, you know, this sort of healthy dynamic that we're constantly trying to perpetuate in the workplace. And that is you know, directness, saying what you think, um, making sure that your needs are met, having your perspective represented. It doesn't mean that you're always going to get your way or that um, people are always going to disagree with you, but you discredit yourself by not, um, you know, really representing your perspective um, in the way that you're intended to. Um, and I, I'm hearkening back to Wolfpack when I say that. And if we go back to the HuffPost article, there's a section in here that explicitly says, uh, the training stated, don't talk to men face to face. So if you think about how that kind of perpetuates, um, you know, dysfunction and uh, a situation that may have been abusive, it, it's very interesting if we dig into this. So a couple mm-hmm. bullet points here say, don't directly confront men in meetings because men perceive this as threatening. Women do not. Meet before or after the meeting instead. If you're having a conversation with a man, cross your legs and sit at an angle to him. Don't talk to a man face to face. Men see that as threatening. Don't be too aggressive or outspoken. <laughs> I mean, this is this is okay. I'm laughing. At, I'm laughing again, but oh my god, I I think about that and I think, okay, so every woman is supposed to go into Ernst and Young and assume that they're confronting an abuser if they're trying to. Mm, good point. If, if they're trying to, um, you know, raise an idea or express an opinion or, you know, have an important work-related conversation. Um, yeah, it, it's not only horrible, a horrible write-up of, of how just idiotic women are supposed to be, and it, but it's also a horrible statement about who, what men are. I mean, I would think yeah. men would be, of today, would be... Just as disgusted with this whole piece. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, I would hope so anyway. Or, or to be a part of a culture that, um, you know, perpetuates this type of thinking, I think it would really have to be, you know, a, again, someone who's not quite up with the times. I, I think about Justin Trudeau appointing women to his cabinet and um, people asking why and him saying, you know, well, it's 2015. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I was, I just read uh, Demi Moore's book Inside Out and I, uh, I had met her very, when I was very, very, very young and a teenager. And uh, so I don't know. And I really admired her career and it was, it was interesting to read in the book about Demi Moore was doing the movie, um, A Few Good Men, the one that she did with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise Mm -hmm. and many other wonderful actors that I can't remember the name of. Sorry, not that any of them will hear this show, but anyway, (laughs) she had said that she was sitting at a table and, you know, she really um, loved the fact that the producer and the director of the film said, you know, she's, her character and Tom Cruise's character would not have an affair in the film. And, um, some of the executives at the studio were like, well, then why is she even in the movie? Oh Oh my God. (laughs) The reason why I really like her so much is she pushed so many boundaries and society wrote it off as all this woman cares about is showing her skin. What a great body she has. All she is this, all the things that we do to tear women down when they're powerful and when you look at the reasons why she made the choices that she made in film and that they were breakthroughs and the magazine covers that she did and they were breakthroughs in, in their way for the time. It's so weird how time has this wonderful way of coming back and okay. going, okay, <clears throat> here's, the, here's the perspective now. So I'm really glad that she did her book because it was, it was fascinating. And honestly, when I read it all, I read through the whole thing and I don't know Ashton Kutcher at all, but I read, this sounds like narcissistic abuse to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Put it, attach yourself to a powerful woman and then proceed to tear her Further down. apart. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I'll have to read that book. Oh mm. yeah. I just read every, yeah. 
we have talked about on shows like, oh, this looks pretty. And he has a history of telling women like January Jones, you'll never make it as an actress. Mm. That, that, that covert narcissism yeah. stuff that goes on. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I have not read that book. Um, sounds like one I need to pick up. The, the message that you were just um, sharing, or really the story that you were sharing about Demi, reminds me also of a interview I heard recently with Gina Davis. <laughs> it was funny because I guess she has a very generic Twitter handle or something um, that's just Gina Davis. And um, her email is the same. And she had written to someone in the film industry at one point to share some of her views on the perception of women in film and the desire to to change that. But her uh, her email was something like, you know, Gina Davis at hotmail.com or something. <laughs> and um, in the subject line, it, it said the real Gina Davis the actor, not some random, random Gina Davis, <laughs> 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 which I thought was good. But anyway, the message that she was talking about in this interview was, um, you know, that very thing, why women historically have been in films and the types of characters that, um, you know, women have traditionally played and the roles for that matter, that have been written into film that are very stereotypical and very narrow in focus, really representing a specific type of role within the film, like you were talking about. And there really being no value of a woman in a film if it wasn't for the purpose of nudity Mm -hmm. or for having sex with a male character or somehow needing to be rescued. So yeah. if if one of those three things didn't exist, then having a female character was superfluous. Yes. And that, that makes me think of the question Diane Sawyer asked uh, Demi Moore, which was, you know, why do you think that, y- you know, you, it was such a big deal. And it's still talked about that you were with a man who was 15 years younger than you, because Demi Moore points out, keep in mind, Bruce Willis, her ex-husband married Emma Henning, I think is her, I don't know what her name, Emma Henning, I think is her name, but, um, and she's 25 years younger than Bruce Willis and nobody bats an eye. And her answer to that, Jimmy Moore's answer to that was, you know, I think it's because we are still tied, our value as a female is still tied to our fertility. Mm. So the older we get, the less value, quote unquote, we have in society. And so people wonder, well, why would this young man want to be with this woman? There'll be a shelf life on that relationship because, you know, her eggs are getting older. She can't, you know, and it's sadly, that is still true today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, that's that's interesting. That hits close to home, just in the sense that you know I'm I'm in my early fifties now, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's not that I'm I am single. It's not that I'm trying to date, but um, you know, that's the first thing that I think of when I think of you know trying to date somebody is oh well, I wonder if you know the perception of my shelf life being gone is is uh, is yeah. is out there even before I am, you know. But yeah. anyway, so. You know, I want to kind of turn this to a positive spin. And if we just think back to, you know, the underlying three messages that the Ernst & Young training was intending to get at, and that's power, presence, and purpose, there really are so many examples in the corporate world, in the news, in business news, that are trying to teach the other side of the lesson uh, around power, presence, and purpose for women. And I mentioned a couple of the real banner waivers or leaders in those, in those areas of Brene Brown and Abby Wambach, just the lesson that they're teaching over and over again about authentic leadership and um, using all of your strengths and skills, because we'll really, we have a responsibility to, 
not only make our lives better while we're here on earth, but also make things better for the next generation of women leaders that are coming up behind us. And if you can imagine that idea uh, really affixing itself to any effort, it says that we're going to do nothing but continue to make things better. Right. And that results in um, things getting exponentially better. So if I think of, you know, how different the workplace is for women now, even since I started my career 20 years ago, there's a huge difference. You know, we were teaching about sexual harassment and the definition of that when I first started my work. Um, and now we're talking about authenticity and showing up despite your history and, right. you know, leveraging that for good because you've learned so much because of what you've come out of. So, you know, I think of a couple leadership initiatives that are going on right now. I'm going to call out Horatia right now, which is a um, you know, plastics raw material company, among other things. That's huge and supports the automotive industry in a big way. And one of the leadership exercises that they currently went through was to talk about automotive news, leading women and Horatia proud um, and talking about women in leadership at Horatia. So there wasn't a whole lot of information on the exercise itself. It's obviously very women focused. Um, but some of the questions that they were asking the participants are, are very significant. If not to go and tell your story to other people, to tell your story to yourself. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions was, what advice do you have for women entering the industry? And imagine the power of that question applied instead of the training of Ernst and Young. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Yeah. Second question, name a woman who inspires you. Hmm. So, you know, think about all of the women in your life, whether you know them personally or not. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg or my neighbor I just went out to dinner with last night, you know, Martha both are women who, yeah. yeah. See, there you go. You know, women who inspire us in significant ways and the power of talking about that in a leadership program at work, you know. Yeah. And then also just describing your career in one word. If you could kind of sum it up um, in one word that really represents everything that you've done, what would that be? Oh, and I can't even think of that. that I, the that, first that, word that popped in my head was good. <laughs> Oh, I love that. You know, here's something interesting, and this is going to make me cry, maybe, but maybe I'll try to. I feel in my bones really good about what it is I do today. Awesome. <laughs> even, with all, not? <laughs> even with all the B, well, this is after a year of just, I mean, this year was tough. This was a. I know, yeah. This is a tough year. And, you know, I think about it in terms of my good friend who, you know, buried their child, their adult child this year. And mm -hmm. I think, oh, it's nothing compared to, it's trite compared to that. But ah, it just was a tough year. A lot of uh, just stuff where I'm like, what the hell was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even still, I feel really good about what I do. I feel this is a place I would want. This is where I would want to inspire women to do really anyone to do, but especially women, young women with a career, you know, wanting that uh, a career to carve out a career, getting work to get to the place where you feel so confident and resonant about what it is that you choose to do with your money, your time, um, you know, your care and tending that you don't feel like you need all this outside validation for it. Like you literally, that's important. It's important to want outside validation. That's part of what pushes you up to climb up the ladder. I mean, that, that, that is a, a an important piece that gets you where you're wanting to go. But I would say work towards getting to the place where you don't need that anymore, where you just do mm -hmm. it because you just, because it's the right thing to do, because it is, 
of service because it is helping other people and there's no denying that what you do helps other people like getting to that place so that you can then move on to, I think what's even more important, which is now I'm working because I don't need any more outside validation. I just am seeking my own validation and I have it, but I, uh, I think that's when you get to start being really creative, when you're free of this box of care around outside validation, because then you start to take, then you really start to take risks because then you realize, Mm -hmm. man, I've had a lot of failures on this road. Yeah. Some of those really sucked. And when you Mm -hmm. stop caring about what other people think, like I had a couple of things happen this year that I thought, Huh. Um, there are a couple people that are that probably, if they know what's going on, are laughing about this or thinking, "Oh, Kristen deserves this because they're upset with me for cutting them out of their life or whatever the reason is." She deserves that. Ha! She's getting what she deserves. And to be at a place now where I go, eh, I don't even care. Like I don't care. <laughs> when I used to care so much about that kind of stuff, and now I'm like, whatever. That's yeah. where I would want young women to get to faster than I did. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's all tied together with what we've been talking about. You know, the whole notion of power, presence, purpose. Yes. It, it seems to me, you know, just from your description, you feel you've settled into your purpose. Yeah. You know? yep. <laughs> but but it doesn't mean that there wasn't a whole lot that you went through to, oh. you know, engage your power and to really tap into it. And then to develop presence, even within your own mind, you know, because we can't develop that confidence unless we can quiet the other voices and really tap into, you know, what we're, what we're saying to ourselves, you know, the things that we really, truly want to do. Absolutely. And there's something great about not needing, like having something horrible happen. Like I, I had a pretty horrible with a horridly abusive person this year. Ju- and I was in a very mm-hmm. scary situation and I got myself out of it. Oh my God, did I get myself out of it? And I, I needed to do that. And that it was a personal thing, but that had an impact on my career. So I think also looking at your whole life is the canvas, not just this job that you do. Like it's not a compartmentalized thing. It's a fluid thing. So this thing I did and it did, it had some work ties to it because this person was also a colleague, but it really personally was me going, uh, 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 honey, uh, uh, and I didn't need to get anybody's <sighs> approval at the end of the day that that was a horrible thing. I had a habit of needing that and wanting to tell people close to me, this is what happened. Oh my God, did it. And hear people say, that's horrible. That's horrible. That's horrible. But at the end of it, I realized I really didn't, I didn't need that validation because I know it was horrible. I know this person was behaving deplorably. There's no excuse for it. And I only needed my own self to say that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, It's trusting, uh, trusting yourself and your perceptions, you know? Yep. Yeah. Especially when you're with a narcissist. Yeah. Yeah, Who's telling you your perceptions are wrong as I'm screaming at you, screaming mother this, and I'm, and I'm charging at you like a raging bull. And this person's drunk out of their mind. And as they're doing that, they're also saying, you're wrong about this perception. I'm not being abusive. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) And you're like, because that's what they try to do, man. Can we let's, let's abuse you, be abusive to people. And then let's also tell you that you're wrong in your perception of it. Wow. That's a narc move if I ever seen one, but, but yeah, anyway, I interrupted you, but yes, being like (laughs) my perception is okay. And listen, when you are someone who has been, you were raised in these kind of relationships, it is, it is very difficult for you to trust your perception because your entire life from the time you were a baby has been about people who are abusive telling you that you're wrong to be upset about this abuse. Mm -hmm. So to come to a place as an adult, it took me until I was 49, took a long time. Oh, well, that was my journey to go. 
you know what? Screw you. This is abusive because I say it is. I know it is. Mm -hmm. You ain't going to change my mind for me. It took me 49 years to get to that place. I'm sorry. I'm going off on a tangent here, but it took that long for me to get to that place because I was raised in, in an environment from the time I could even speak, think, whatever, that, you know, abuse isn't abuse. So sometimes mm -hmm. it takes people a long damn time. And that has an effect on who you allow into your work, who you allow into your home, who you allow anywhere. It affects every area of your life, including your career. Absolutely. Yeah. And even the way you conduct your personal affairs, you know, yep. and think about somebody who um, has, you know, felt deprived or maybe was food insecure or, you know, somehow uh, did not feel that they were getting their needs met in one way or another. That's going to manifest itself in, in some form as an adult, regardless of what it is. You know, and, yeah, and so, we spend so much time at work that it's most likely it's going to manifest in the place of where you spend the most time. That's why you know we yeah. create those family relationships at work and stuff. So, you better pay attention to what's going on in all your life, not just at work, yeah. because all your life feeds this place that you spend the majority of your time. Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, I. I'll just tell a quick story about a conversation that I had with my boss recently. So I just started the job that I'm in about three years ago. It'll be three years in January. Um, it's a great company. I'm really enjoying uh, learning about this company and understanding the industry because it's a little different than anything that I've done before. Um, so not only was there a learning curve in joining the company, but I was also uh, in the process or on the tail end, I would say, of separating myself from an, an abusive situation. And I noticed that it was very much affecting the way that I was showing up at work. So I was showing up mm. um, to do my job in the way that I was showing up in my relationship before I made the choice to leave, which was in a defensive manner mm. and ready to fight. And so somehow I needed to reframe my reality and explain to myself in a calm and peaceful manner <laughs> that my needs were going to get met if I did not show up ready to fight. My needs were going to be met in terms of being listened to and having my opinions weighed and valued if I showed up as myself instead of the defensive version of myself. Mm. And um, you know, the conversation with my boss was, you know what, you've come a long way in this because I was very candid with them when I joined. You know, there were certain things that were noticed, just me not fitting very well into the culture immediately. And a lot of it was because of that defensiveness right. um, and that perception that unless I was ready to fight, that I wasn't going to be taken seriously. My needs weren't going to be met. Weren't, I wasn't going to be heard, et cetera. So, you know, I, I, and like I said, I'm in my early fifties and it, it's taken that long for me to learn it. Right. Yeah, it was it. something I couldn't see before, but now that I'm not in that situation anymore, I can see those behaviors much more clearly in myself. And I'm really thankful for that. Oh gosh, um, that's, that's a good one. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> so, you know, I want to um, talk about purpose again and okay. our right to succeed. And, uh, you know, just in the things that you've been talking about, Kristen, um, you've succeeded greatly in what you do, you know, not only in the sense that you've brought in, brought in, oh my God, that's not even a word. You've brought, um, <laughs> hello, do that hey, all the time. it is only 841 on a Sunday morning here. So <laughs> I've only had half a cup of coffee. You're really I brought it to the show words. today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, but you know, you, you brought this collaboration together it's doing good things you know you feel a, a sense of purpose um and you know what you're doing when you wake up in the morning and that's not to say every decision is taken care of and right. you know there's not stumbles and whatnot but you know you know what your purpose is and um i, I think it's wonderful that in in more and more ways every day women do have the opportunity to succeed right and going back to the Ernst and Young article, it and again I want to take the the opposite stance because I don't want to you know dig this into negative, 
But when we have the opportunity to succeed and actually be appreciated for ourselves and how being ourselves has contributed to that success, you know, again, I think we get to that exponential improvement that Brene Brown and, and Abby Wambach are talking about. You know, it's taking risks, understanding our purpose, and finally succeeding in having the ability to kind of celebrate ourselves, knowing that we were authentic and getting to where we, where we went. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I was thinking in that context also about a TED talk that was given by Sheryl Sandberg. Mm, yes. And the title of the TED talk is why we have too few women leaders. And it goes into a number of different arguments or points uh, about, you know, being women, about, you know, having these multiple expectations against us where we um, apply, a, and these are, these are my words and the words of Ann Stevens, a, a woman I knew at Ford, sometimes we have to turn the dimmer switch up or down in certain aspects of our lives because we are women and, and often women don't, or often men don't have to make the same choices that we do. So we may make the choice to stay home and take care of our baby for a year because that's our choice and forego permission, but the guy next to us didn't do that. And so what do our mutual lives look like three years from now as a result of those choices? Um, and are we going to get bored if we make choices that are, um, you know, more um, typical of the choices that women would have to make, like to have a child or to, you know, right. take a break or to, you know, adjust our work schedule in order to accommodate the rest of our lives. Um, but her objective for her own daughter is to have the choice not just to succeed and to clearly have the, you know, the indicators point to uh, an arrow that says, yep, that's success, but also to be liked for the accomplishments, you know, to be appreciated yeah. For them I loved and that. not I loved that. Yeah, isn't end. that great? <laughs> yeah, that she to be liked for her accomplishments. I loved that. I want to read a little bit of the because I I was still to read it. I, I guess because I'm, you know, I built my own company and I so some I don't have to deal with that yuck every day like many 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 women do. Even you do because I it's me running this. So I'm, I'm a little out of touch with what still goes on. Anyway, this, this hit me. 190 heads of state, nine are women. Of all the people in parliament in the world, 13% is only what women are. In the corporate sector, women at the top, C-level jobs, board seats, tops out at 15 to 16%. I mean, really you know, stats and stuff. Sometimes I don't really hear those things, but really hear what mm -hmm. I just said. In the corporate mm -hmm. sector, women top out in terms of upper level jobs, board seats, and so on at 15 to 16%. And those numbers have not moved since 2002. And they're actually going in the wrong direction. I mean, and, and she even says in her TED talk that in her lifetime, she's not going to see the kind of change that she wants to see. Right. So she's, now she literally is just working for her daughter's lifetime, her right. kid's lifetime. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's a direct reference to that exponential change um, because we have to see it, you know, we're get better. The platform that we're, creating for the women coming up in the next generation is lower, you know? <laughs> so wh yeah. why would we want to start them from a, a place that's lower than where we had to start from? Um, and I will make a political comment. You know, sometimes it does feel that way right now. It's the end of 2019. Um, the political climate in the U S is, is not great relative to women. However, I am encouraged by some of the change that I see. You know, I see more women getting elected. I hear stronger voices. You know, I, I see a lot more. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not militant at all myself, but I do love the notion of smash the 
the patriarchy, you know, Mm -hmm. and I don't mean, you know, go out and kill all the men. That's certainly (laughs) not what I'm talking about. Exactly. But I'm talking about this perception that's referred to directly here with all of the statistics that you just listed off, you know, Mm -hmm. when, when is this going to be different and what's preventing us from actually making it different? It has to happen now. So yeah, it's not about us anymore. It's about how we make things better for the people coming up behind us. However, I, you know, I read all the way through this TED talk. I listen to it, and um, every point she makes, uh, I I feel very um, personally engaged in. You know, I do too. I do too. I was thinking about this today, and I actually was talking to Kim Saeed this morning, who's also on the network. And it's, I I was saying to her, you know, I mean, I have. Uh, my colleagues and my friends who are really, they want to, they're really on that success ladder. They want to be well-known. You can hear it in what they're doing and saying. And I, and the things that they want to be well-known for are really good things. Like I don't have any, you know, man, if they could just stop caring, but I don't mean that this and that way at all. I want them to be well-known for the stuff they have to say. Oh yeah. But where well, not even a but. And where I'm at is I just don't really care about being well known. <laughs> mm-hmm. That doesn't interest me. I've, I, I think what happens when you've done a lot of stuff, like I have done a lot of public speaking in my lifetime. I, I don't know. I just don't, I don't care about being the next Brene Brown or having a career that models that or did it, you know, and I, again, I'd want to say that with not putting someone down who does want that. That's not what I mean. I just mean for mm-hmm. me, I'm confident in what I've done so far. I want to do other things. And right now I just, as I'm going to be 50 coming up in, a, in about six weeks, I guess, or maybe seven weeks. I'm like, you know, I just, there's other stuff I want to do. And a lot of it is really more quiet. I really feel like going within more than I ever have. And I've always been a within person, but I want to do that even more. It doesn't mean I'm not going to continue having this network and that this network isn't going to grow because we are, believe me, we're starting a mass violence podcast network for support and advocacy. And we're, you know, on and on and on. There's all kinds of cool stuff that we're doing. But every choice that I make to do something is not based on, oh, let me show the world who I am and what I care about, what I do as if I need that validation, like we talked about before. It's really Mm -hmm. literally do it because it's interesting to me. And I know that what it is will be very helpful to a lot of people. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't, I just, I don't, I I don't, maybe because I live in the country. I don't know. I don't, it's uh, another thing I'd say to younger women is have a dichotomy in your life. So Mm -hmm. don't, if you live in New York and you're on the New York grind, let's just use that as as an example. And, and you're on the, I'm going to write a book, or maybe I have written a book and it's how many reviews I have. And I have this Instagram account and Facebook did it on, I have all these followers and you know, everything about the world tells you that you have to be admired and followed and liked and blah, 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 in order for you to have value. Okay. So that's what the world is going to tell you is all that stuff. And you spend a lifetime, hopefully moving towards the place where you realize that none of that shite means a damn thing about your value. The only Mm -hmm. value that you need to care about is your own. Yep. And so have some dichotomy in your life, meaning it is a wonderful thing for me to have this network and all this stuff and whatever it looks like and how it's perceived out in the world, even with some, you know, 0.5% joker that tries to tear it down because they were asked to leave. Like the, the higher you sort of get, the more you're going to have, you know, really awful malicious people try to tear it down, whatever, Uh, Yeah, you know, but even with that, I live in a place where nobody cares 
Like when I go to the grocery store or like, that's the dichotomy for me out there. It, this is a big thing. And it looks like this and it did da, da, da. And where I live every single day with my dogs and my horses and in this little country place, and I will never not live in the country. Nobody cares when I go to the grocery store. Nobody even knows what I do. And if they hear about it, <laughs> if I'm at a dinner party or something and people ask, and I reluctantly say what it is, unless, you know, it feels appropriate or whatever, um, you know, people are like, really? That's what you, like, they, it's shocking. It is utterly because I don't look like I guess what somebody I don't know what it is but that is such a great thing to have in your life that place mm-hmm. where nobody cares about that outside yeah. stuff it's so yeah. invaluable to have that I agree I agree um <laughs> um do, do you think that that sort of um and, and it's not self-satisfaction like smugness at all it's just Mm -hmm. satisfaction knowing that you can be quiet and settled in yourself um and um i i think you know quiet in your own presence knowing what that contains but being in a place also where you you know don't necessarily feel you need to share it unless you want to (laughs) yeah Uh, Yeah. And not feeling propelled. I mean, listen, here's a great thing about having um, a couple of people really attack you and attack you in a public way and try to tear down what it is you do. You know, you live through it um, and have it be stuff that is so horrifically, it's just disgusting. And they make themselves look like disgusting, disgusting human beings for what they're saying. And also clearly in need of so much mental health care you know, just so much mental health care to be this vile, but to have that happen is, uh, and the good thing about that is I've gotten to a place where I'm like, you know, uh, what, what do I have control over? You know, I don't have control over someone that is, that behaves that way. And, And I just, it's not even about me. Their junk isn't even about me. One of them, it's literally about them trying to get money. It's about trying to get people to donate to them. And I'm just the thing that they're going to, the shiny thing they're going to use to try to make that happen. If it isn't, it, you know, when we read about narcissism stuff and they say, don't take it personally, mm-hmm. that's really the truth. It's really not about you at all. Mm-hmm. And so to have that happen and to keep on trucking, keep doing what I'm doing, know that that stuff is there. I get it now when friends of mine who are very well known that have said, but oh my God, what am I going to do? This person is accusing me of da 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 da, and they're putting it all over the social media. And, you know, a friend of mine whose face is superimposed onto porn stars and spent millions trying to get that stuff taken down. And every time she wins, because she wins every time, it just shows up in some other country and there aren't laws around protecting that. And then, and she's got to still just go to work and show up at a movie premiere and, you know, do her thing. And I mean, there's something to be said for having, I guess what I've learned is when you have that stuff happen in your life, you just, how you handle it is really uh, becomes important, how you handle it in different ways. Um, Mm -hmm. It's kind let me break it down in an even more simple way. I was out with my horse. This happened yesterday. And we were walking. I wasn't riding her. I was with her and I was with my two little dogs and we were going down this trail and I guess we veered off. I mean, I wish they would mark these freaking trails, but they don't. And if you tell the people about it, they talk to you like you're stupid for not knowing. But <laughs> you shouldn't have gone that way on the trail because, uh, you know, that's where they today is the first day of turkey season and i'm like okay didn't you know i didn't you know that (laughs) didn't you smell the wind because you're a hunter no i don't kill animals for pleasure thank you very much i don't kill animals period but but anyway that's a whole other thing but anyway my horse rightly so got spooked about something i think i heard a gunshot but you know she's smarter than me in that situation she knows what the hell's going on so she takes off and she's running like hell towards the barn. One of my dogs is going after her because he's learning how to be a, a um, you know, a healer. He's doing what instinct tells him to do. And I'm in the forest and I'm like, okay, 
I can wig out and think, oh my God, what if she runs into this horrible traffic? What if she, she runs right past the barn? My dog too. There could be deaths. Other people could, you know, you run through all these scenarios. And then I just went, you know what? There's nothing I can do right now except walk towards the barn and hope that everything is okay. Or just know that everything's going to be okay or not even know that just all I can do is literally just walk towards the barn. That's it. That's all mm -hmm. I could do. Worry, freaking out. Like I can't stop some whack job that needs help that their parents should have done more to help them, but whatever from writing crappy stuff about me. I can't stop that because it isn't even about me. I can't stop my horse from going and doing whatever. I just can keep doing what I'm doing and be really okay uh, because I have this validation for myself finally. And yeah. that's all I can do. And that is enough. That is okay. And that is wonderful. And that is good. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm a big subscriber to all you can do is all you can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sure enough, yeah. my horse was stuck wrapped in a tree with vines wrapped in the rain in the um lead rope, and my dog was standing there ar, 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 looking at her. She wasn't anywhere near the road, she hadn't even made it halfway there. And I pulled her out and we walked back safely to the barn, and nobody was the wiser, nobody had any clue. What I was also thinking of, oh god, this girl there that has to put everybody down and is kind of a little bit of an emotional bully. Um has to talk to people like they're stupid. Even that was a lesson in, okay, well, if she does, she does. And, and instead of, even in that, I've had this, uh, with, I don't want to be around this person because they do that. But even being older and wiser and going, instead of just popping off and saying something back to her for making me, well, she can't make me feel stupid, but for saying something that I then feel stupid because I didn't know, uh, or I shouldn't have gone on that trail or whatever. I instead think, God, if she's that critical and judgmental of other people, imagine the conversations she must have with herself. They must be awful. And to have compassion, right. that, that takes a lot of work. And I think about oh, that with someone right. talking shit about me. Like, okay, well, you know what? If If you are so... If that you need so much validation that you have to get it by being hateful and awful and uh, then my God, I don't feel sorry for you because you're making a choice, but I do feel for you as a human being that you're in that much pain. Right. I wouldn't want to be you. Right. Boy, and what a, what a place to get to where we can, you know, look at that kind of behavior in others and realize that it isn't about us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really about. And that's not to say we shouldn't apologize when we do things wrong yeah. or that we shouldn't take responsibility for our actions. But, you know, we, we don't own everything out there. We don't own everybody's reaction. We don't no. own everybody's, you know, everybody's feelings about certain situations. So I yeah. think that's you know, a really good way to look at it. I but like that story. Thank you. <laughs> doesn't that speak to leadership? I mean, really what we're talking about at the yeah. end of the day is, is, leadership is can be whatever it can be and there are people like Cheryl Sandberg who have this big platform and that's what her soul is supposed to be doing in this lifetime and good for her for doing it i am not lesser than because i haven't because i'm not doing what she does i'm doing mm -hmm. my own thing which is important to my soul there's no comparison of the two i wish people would get that but at the end at the end of that is what is important about leadership leadership right. of yourself yes yeah and um <laughs> you know the embodiment of power presence and purpose regardless of what ernst and young said <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah oh my goodness i just looked at them and i thought well their stock is going to go down <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. You know, I, I haven't looked at the stock since then. Maybe I should take a peek this morning. That'd be kind of interesting. <laughs> or, they, or they've lost a lot of respect. You know, I mean, I just yeah. looked at it like, wow, they've really, you know, but that they're, they're in for a interesting ride with that kind of stuff getting let out. And thank you to the women who did let it out. Yes. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, for sure.
I feel like I interrupted you through this whole thing and I apologize. No, that. absolutely not. No, I, I don't feel that way at all. Good, good conversation. <laughs> Anything else that you wanted to cover in this? Um, you know, I, I just, I, I just want to kind of reiterate, I, I think something that you were just talking about, Kristen, and that is, you know, we don't, develop any of these things, power, presence, or purpose by suppressing ourselves. And it's, and it's when we really are able to get quiet and satisfied in what we're doing today and realizing that, um, you know, things around us don't have to be taken as personally as we may have thought in our earlier years or earlier experiences. You know, I'm not diminishing youth at all because I think that there's a lot of wisdom um, and lessons that can come out of youth. So I'm not, I'm not saying um, you know, things that we learn early as a reflection of being older or younger, just saying that sometimes, um, you know, learning the lessons early really, really help us in order to move through and find what that purpose is. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I um, thank you for this discussion. <laughs> Those are really, uh, Really interesting, <laughs> I, I, and I, I I think that you know it's a contrast between, um, you know the the lack of self that I think the the training at Ernst and Young was trying to um, teach people versus you know what happens when we really are able to become our full selves. So, Agreed. two ends of the spectrum. Agreed. I want to I want to um, come to a close with this story because I just thought of it as you were talking, um, and I was it, it, it came to me when I was reading the the piece in Sheryl Sandberg's story where she was in a three hour meeting, and she everybody had to get up and and it was at this fancy New York office and everybody had to get up and go to the bathroom and you know, take a bio break, and <laughs> the guy that you know owns the or is the owner of the company or whatever was embarrassed because he didn't know where the women's room was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was like, Oh, I, she just assumed that, well, they, maybe they just moved in and that's why. And, and, um, she said, did you just move into this office? And he said, no, we've been here a year. And she said, are you telling me that I'm the only woman to have pitched a deal in this office in a year? And he looked at her and said, yeah, or maybe you're the only one who had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> So there's, there's that. And then the other thing is I was listening to Oprah Winfrey talking about recently she was somewhere shopping and uh, someone was being, you know, she had that experience where she experienced racism, which she's experienced that her whole life. Okay. But this, you know, the one where about the purse in France and they, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this was another one where someone was not letting her buy something. And she said she just stopped and went and just didn't feel like arguing, didn't feel like making it a big deal. She just went, you know, you're right. It's probably too much to, for me to afford this and just let it go. She just let it go. You know, like she didn't, she just, mm. let it go. And I, that my friends is wisdom. There's, there's yeah. times that you need to fight. There really are. And then, but the, there's, as you get older, you realize that you don't need to show up to every fight that <laughs> sometimes yeah. you just go, okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and it's exactly, you're right. It's too blah, blah, blah. That's kind of how I look at some of the stuff that's happened this year. Okay, I'm not gonna. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Move on. Yeah. So, anyway, thank you for doing another Women Who Lead show and for coming up with such a great topic. Thank you. I really appreciate the time. I always love talking to you. So, I appreciate <laughs> that too. <laughs> and, listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Mental Health News Radio. But never without good intentions I heat up and act on my emotions Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. 
Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all, we promised we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you, I can find it. Good boy.